Here in the Hyundai Texans Radio Studio, joined with head coach Lovey Smith. Coach, great to see you. All right, let's talk a little bit about the game against the Giants. Uh, take me to after halftime, they score, and you weren't really moving the ball the way you wanted to in the first half, and all of a sudden you start moving the ball better in the second half. What was the difference? Let's focus on the offensive side of the ball when you started to be able to move it better. Maybe a little bit more tempo, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what happens except some of it is just sense of urgency. And there's always a sense of urgency, but when you're you know, in the second half and time is running out and you need to make a move, that seems to speed things up. And for whatever reason, we started making plays. Protection was a little bit better, mm -hmm. able to run the football a little bit better, receivers catching balls. Um, did a whole lot of good things. It's just that you know, not for the, the entire drive, that's what's just really disappointing when you do enough to get down there so many times. But that's the first step is to get down there so many times. And now that we just got to be able to find a way to get it in the end zone. We talk about halftime adjustments. I don't know what kind of paint you peeled off the walls with your halftime speech with them, Coach, but five drives in the second half, all five got in the red zone. But you complete the first one, Nico Collins catching that sluggo in the back of the end zone. What are you seeing from Nico, A, now that he's back, but just since you since you saw him last year as a rookie and now you're seeing him progress into his second year and getting him back yesterday, what have you seen from Nico Collins? Well, uh, Nico, who threw him that ball? I think it was Davis, <laughs> Davis Mills. Davis. Okay, all right. Davis I think Mills. it was Davis that threw him that ball. But yeah. Nico Collins, is, first he's a big target. Uh, he runs excellent routes. And again, big body, he can block. I uh, can, can catch, and uh, especially down in the red zone where he's going to have a, an advantage over most defensive backs. But great route, great, it was great placement of the ball, one that we needed. And as I look at the other drives that we were down there, we did so many good things to get down there, you know, a penalty stopping yep. us, uh, things like that. Just can't have those things just doing a lot of good and just one really bad thing can just curtail a lot, an awful lot. All right, so they have Fabian Moreau, who we are very familiar with. And yeah. not that it happened yesterday, Coach, but in general, when you see players that you've coached before on other teams, does that help you in general game plan against them? I think you always uh, use all the information that you have, and we do. You know, we had Fabian here. He's a good football player. And, and after he left here, of course, he's starting for them, and they're having a heck of a year. And he's a good football player, but – you know, as we talk about the Nico Collins, uh, Brandon Cooks, uh, Chris Moore played outstanding football, I might add, yesterday too. We still like the matchups that we have. You know, uh, our, our receivers, especially in one-on-one -on -one situations, we knew they were going to blitz an awful lot, and it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's by winning those one-on-one -on -one battles outside, and we won a lot of them. And, Coach, you talk about the blitzing a lot. The screen game was really good. It felt like there were about four or five different screen receivers that capitalized on big plays, including Jordan Aikens went for 46. What was the, was it just not nothing's ever simple, but because they blitzed so much, you were able to take advantage of that aggressiveness with the screens? Yeah. I mean, most, you know, if you're a blitz team, most uh, defensive blitz, they want you to sit back there and especially in, uh, drop back yeah. and pass the football. That's why I'm first mixing in the run. And that was effective at times yep. yesterday against it. But, yes, the screens, that's the easiest way. Let the guys take off and rush and then dump the ball off to the re – yesterday receiver-wise, running backs, we got them all in there. And there were big plays that we were able to hit. That's why I game plan wise I like what we're able to do. Coach, we get a lot of questions on the offense and the tempo, like you mentioned. Now – is it too much to run up tempo earlier in the game? No, is it question. easier said than done? How does that work? No, a good question. I can see why you would ask it. Um, just seem it does seem like for whatever reason that's just the history of the game. <laughs> seem like that sense of urgency that you feel. You know, normally when you most teams are doing it, uh, you're behind and you need to get something going right away. But you know, if you it can backfire a little bit too. Mm -hmm. If you a quick three and out. <laughs> Doesn't help the whole team, yeah. Uh, team flow of the game, but um, that that's a, a a question I can see is asked, and there's no rhyme or reason on why. Sometimes you just want to kickstart things and get it going a little bit, and that's where we we thought a little bit yesterday. Coach, you've seen that as a defensive coordinator over many many years. What's 
What's the biggest issue for a defense when you're facing a team that is going with maybe not NASCAR tempo, but is speeding it up a little bit more? It's just communication. You know, a lot of times, you know, we don't get a chance. Uh, and it's really hard tempo wise if you don't uh, if you don't substitute. Yep. So to you maybe have you have one personnel grouping out there and you want to get into another, it kind of limits what you can do a little bit. And when you go up tempo, it's one thing when defense can get in the hole and everybody get the communication right as opposed to when you kind of spray it out, um, you, it can lead to a bust. Um, they up tempo with us. We had a couple times yesterday when we didn't get the call to everyone. Yep. Those are some of the things that can happen. They did it a lot, too, where they would get up to the line but not snap the ball. They would just get ready, and they could snap the ball, but then Jones would stand up and talk to his teammates. It reminded me of just the stand-up part, Peyton Manning. Not that Jones reminds me that much of Peyton Manning, but it sort of puts you at a ready position defensively. What is that like, and how did you deal with it? Well, I mean, that's what you're trying to do. I know you mentioned Peyton, but that's uh, more of the college game that's coming into our league right now where everything is about that. Get to the line real quick. Try to get the defense to be in some type of vanilla defense, and you check out the front. You just get a pre-snap read, and then you and then offenses make their call from there. Coach Saquon gets 152 yards on the ground, but it takes him 35 carries to do it. And it was something we talked a little bit about um, during the game. But after you went back and watched the film, you had a number of stuffs. You had a number of plays made by guys. And then he would reel off a run that would get them a first down and get them going. How did you feel overall when you went back and you watched the film of the run defense against Saquon and, and Matt Breida? John, so, uh, what we do as you're looking at, yes, yeah, always about how many yards the team was able to rush right. the ball against you, but um, we do look at the yards per carry. And uh, yesterday, Damon yeah. had a better yards per carry yes, average than Saquon did. But uh, a great running back, you just have to realize um, you can stop him, stop him. Eventually, they're going to be able to break, break a few, and that was the case. He had about three or four where we weren't able to keep him pinned in. But then in an ideal world, I mean, we want to be in that situation where we can give it to our tailback almost 40 times a game. And uh, most of the time, if you're doing that, it says win at the end. Coach, I'm looking at college football, and a lot of these teams have one game left, two games left, maybe a bowl. And then I look at the rookies on the Houston Texans thinking, you know, they have eight games in the regular season here. So it's a different kind of clock on their body and toll on their body, plus training camp, plus whatever offseason stuff they had, which was a lot. So how do you deal with that as a coach to preserve them moving forward with such a huge chunk of the season left? Well, I, th I think it's they know going in that, hey, that's one of the things you talk about earlier. Hey, guys, it's going to be a long season. You're going to hit that you know, rookie wall, whatever you want to call it, and just be prepared for it. But in our situation, I think it can really be a benefit for us because we haven't played our best ball. And, guys, all right, there's some disappointment that we've had. But you know we have eight – you know, in the regular season we have eight games to go. We can get this right. So we're looking at it more as an opportunity. And even though rookies haven't played that many games, they're young and fit with a lot of energy. Mm. And I know they'll be ready to go. Coach, I know your rookies yesterday made a ton of plays, and I know there were some they probably would like to have back for sure. The psychologist part of being a head coach when you have young guys that do have some struggles out on the field, how difficult is that to, to speak with them or to get them to keep their confidence as they go through the rest of the season? Because, I mean, they're facing up against some pretty good players, but they've been making plays. Okay, they didn't have the greatest game. How do you kind of deal with building their confidence back up for the next game? First, I mean, you just got to be real. And um, when some mistakes happen, like we're talking about, you just try to give them answers for how you can correct it and to keep going and just let them know that you're not the first rookie. Yeah. You're not the first person to make these mistakes. And truth of the matter, um, you, this is not your best ball that you're playing right. No rookie is playing his best ball. They're going to get better as time goes along. And as far as the confidence part is that there is a reason why they're here. And there are – they're just not making enough. And there are some mistakes. For the majority of the guys that we see playing, our rookies playing – Majority of the plays that they're making are positive plays, and you keep building on those. Well, we were talking about that with Kenyon Green, rookie, and had a couple of penalties or whatever, has a bunch of great blocks as well. And then you have a guy like Laramie Tunsil who's been around the block here, and he's a captain now. So do you want your veterans to really help with that, feeding them that good information about being patient and staying with it? Yeah, and when I say we, it's coaching staff, veteran players, uh, in all three phases. Uh, that's what we're doing. 
And, and, I, and I think they're okay with it. I think there's a certain group. I mean, this certain group of uh, rookie young players that we have, they buy into everything that you're saying. So, and they'll be okay. It's just something that you have to go through. Coach, I know that being involved in defense the way that you are and just as a head coach, and you obviously do not want to see the opponents do well. But are there times when you step back and go, boy, that guy's really good, i.e. 97 yesterday, Dexter Lawrence. Do you kind of take a second and just almost respect like tip of the cap of how good that guy actually is? Or in the moment, are you just like, oh, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? Do you kind of tip your cap at some point like, boy, that guy's a good player? Yeah, I think a little of both. I mean, leading up to the week, we have a chance then. You know who we're getting ready to go against. And, uh, yeah, you have to acknowledge just great play uh, at all the positions. You know, you know, he been, you know, calling defense and all that, you know, first time at going against Saquon Barkley, yep. you know, knowing his history. And so all that come into play is you mentioned the defensive uh, seemed like last three or four games, the interior defensive linemen that we've played have been a special group each week. They yep. have it one and most of the, you know, have had a couple. Yep. Uh, so you do have to acknowledge you know, that talent. All right, a couple of players to put in the spotlight here. Christian Harris, how's he doing? Because he came in a little bit later, coming back from the injury. So maybe in some ways he's fresher than some of the other guys. And he had a lot of tackles yesterday, looked pretty good out there. What are you seeing in him so far? That's what we're seeing. We're seeing, first off, an elite athlete that's getting better and better every rep he gets. And that's what happened with young players. They're going to make some mistakes, but those flash plays, the majority of the plays that they're going to make, ones you say yes and seem like each week with Christian Harris and maybe a little bit more even yesterday you say yeah that's why that's why we drafted him and this is why you know going forward we're going to be in pretty good shape and seem like we're saying that for quite a few of the guys Tegan got his most action yesterday mm -hmm. at the tight end position so all those guys are taking steps learning on the run all those things that um, eventually we're going to see that finished product Coach, it's not a rookie, but I, mean, yeah, I guess he isn't even here for the first time. But because he came here after training camp, I think we sort of forget there's a little gap there for Jordan Akins. What has he brought to the offense since he's gotten here? It feels like every game there's at least one play he's going to make in a game that's big, and it felt like there were a couple of them yesterday. What has he brought to your offense? I think this big play ability from the, I guess, tight end position. <laughs> you know, um, but he's a weapon, you know. He is a tough matchup. You know, normally you're tight end. Yeah. Um, linebacker or safety is guarding him. He's a lot bigger. And it's faster than most. Yep. And um, just the plays he's made, catching the football, you talk about a great addition that we've added to the mix late. Um, he's one of the guys that seemed like each week we've kind of seen a similar, uh, similar game from him, and that's giving us a chance to win. Speaking of not a rookie, Jerry Hughes, coach. He has eight sacks, and that is the total you had from any individual player last year. So he's got eight games to go to eclipse that total. But I know it's not just about that because knowing you, you probably said to Jerry, get the ball out more. But he also had another nice TFL on Barkley. What about his progress, though, within this defense joining the Houston Texans? Just been exceptional. He, he's just been a uh, breath of fresh air, just great with everything that he's done representing, you know, our organization and just a defensive leader. Uh, and it's more about, hey, guys, watch me. Yeah, I'm going to talk. And Jerry lets them know what to do. But watch the way I work. Watch the way I play. Relentless attitude. Couldn't be more pleased with what he's done. I knew him from afar. Mm -hmm. But and play that many years, you're right, eight sacks right now. And there's about three or four others that easily he could have. Just excited about him the second half of the season. Now, you know, now we're in for that home stretch. And you need some veterans to step up and lead us. And I know how he's going to lead us. Coach, during the games, I'm always in Mark's ear. So I try and help him out with who makes tackles. And I felt myself yesterday saying Oboe's name a lot. I won't say his last name because sometimes I can butcher it. But... I was saying Oboe's name a lot. It felt like he was making some impact plays, even against the run. When you look at him, you think, okay, he's a pass rusher, but you're seeing him make some plays on the run. What do you think when you went back and watched the film on Oboe? I like it. It's like what I'm saying about uh, Jerry. Loved everything about what Oboe did yesterday, too. We a Big emphasis this past week was just, you know, pursue, 
yeah. uh, relentless effort, getting trying to get 11 guys to the ball, and uh, he did that. He rushed the pass well. He did play the run. Yeah. Uh, just seemed like his entire game. He was one of those guys with energy throughout, trying to get everybody else going. Uh, again, he has improved quite a bit, you know, weekly for us, and he'll have a bigger part in our game plan as we go forward. All right. Well, and they're local guys, too, which is great. Yeah. Obo and Jerry Hughes and among others. All right, let's talk about the game a little bit coming up on Sunday. Not just the opponent, though, because salute to service day, Coach. And I know we have these theme games, and they're all important. They're all big. This is gigantic here, salute to service. It's always a big event, no matter what the situation is. You're playing the commanders. What does this theme mean to you, though, with salute to service going on? Well, it means quite a bit. You know, my uh, uh, grandfather, father were both uh, servicemen uh, in the Army. One of my best friends in, you know, in life, and of course in football, Rod Marinelli, who I worked with for many years. Both of them are, you know, are veterans, and I I know what the sacrifices that they make. You know that we may be able to coach football, play football. So to be able to honor them on this special month for a special game uh, is always exciting for for all of us, and. Um, one way to honor them is to is to play a certain way too. Mm-hmm. You know the standard that we have in our, all of our military branches. I mean, it's a standard that's you know kind of on top, and that's how we want to honor them this week. Coach the Commanders. I don't know if you've gone too much into the film, but Taylor Heineke, uh, quarterback that you get a chance to see tonight. We don't have to talk about that, but they'll be on Monday night, so a good chance to see them. But just the Commanders overall. Could get Chase Young back. He's not going to play on Monday night, but he could potentially play against us. What are your thoughts from 30,000-foot view on the commanders? Uh, you know, known Ron Rivera for a long period of time. Chris Harris, other player, you know, players, coaches that I work with, I know the guys will be ready to go, know how they, you know, they're going to play. Yeah. You know, uh, offensively, multiple commitment to the run, just one of those old-fashioned tough ball games. Uh but they're, you know, like all of us, we're fighting hard. And I haven't had a chance to, you know, critique them and evaluate them as much as we will get into yep. it. But, um, you know, I know defensively a lot of first-rounders up front and what they have. I know the talent level they have on the offensive side of the football. We, of course, just, you know, we just played the Eagles not long ago. So it's always good when you see uh, your next opponent coming in playing a common opponent to see how they kind of match up with them a little bit. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you get to watch them on television. And we've talked about that before. It's not the all-22 look, but you do get to see a bunch of stuff, and you like hearing what you're going to see as well. (laughs) Yeah, I like listening to the announcers. They normally give us, you know, will give you a little bit that you don't know. But just to get the feel of a game. A lot of times when our, you know, our tape that we have, you don't get from start to finish. There's a little break in action in between, but – when you watch it live, you get a chance to see and hear everything that's going on. So we'll be watching the game for sure. So the listeners know, before you coach a game, the day before, you meet with the announcers, right? And the TV producer. Can you take us through a little bit of, of that, the way you see it as a coach? It's important for the broadcast. They get a little bit of extra information. Not all of it is off the record stuff. Some of it is background. But take us through that, coach. Well, I mean, they're getting ready to, uh, you know, to – uh, call a game and try to educate the audience as much as you possibly can. So the best way to do that is for them to come in and talk, get a little bit of a game plan on how each team it will try to attack the opponent. So, yes, most TV crews come in, we speak to them uh, before a game, normally the day before a game is, or, or Friday before Sunday game, and we kind of tell them the starting lineups, who's going to play kind of the game plan a little bit on what we're trying to do. So that's why it's pretty important for, you know, all announcers have this information and they want to educate our audience. So we, we'll be a part of the audience, too. And now when they're talking to us, now we try not to get them too much information. Yeah. I throw that yeah. in there, right. too. There's an element of trust there, though. Isn't <laughs> yeah. There's there? an element of trust there. But, um, again, in order nowadays, because there's an educated crowd, fan that's watching the game, that want to know some of the details about what's going on. Coach, how is it for championship and 
Super Bowls. You've been in those games too. Does it change? Is it is it more of it, or is it just the same kind of meeting as you get ready for even same, just, same game? It's the same meetings that go uh, college. It's the same colleges. The, the production crew, TV crew, comes in a day or so before the game and talk, or at the hotel the yeah. day before. But uh, that that goes on, and that's just a stable of uh, a televised game now. All right, Amogee Bank, Ask Coach Question of the Week. And, Coach, I've been sort of intentionally, accidentally calling the commanders the Commodores <laughs> from time to time. So help me out here because friends have been texting in, and some even said that Cool and the Gang might be better than the Commodores. So I need your help on this. And, and also, Commodores with or without Lionel Richie. Your thoughts, Coach. You help Ooh, us out here. Well, Ooh, you know, I'm a big Commodores fan. Uh I love the early Commodores, of course, with Lionel Richie. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's pretty hard to beat them at any time. And there's a good uh, – on a given – any given seven-day week, I'm listening to the Commodores at least five of those days. So I would definitely say that. That's amazing. Well, n- I thought – I said this morning on the air, Night Shift is one of the greatest songs that nobody ever talks about. And that's without Lionel, that was, actually. With, that was without yeah. Lionel. And uh, there's just, you know – we could go down the list of uh, of Commodore, and then I'm gonna go to Lionel Richie when he left too. Oh yeah. Of just wow. when you have talent, it doesn't matter if you're with the group or without. You kind of get the same thing. Okay, I gotta ask this because a video, a, a, a GIF popped up on, or a video popped up on my Twitter timeline. Made me think of this: Commodores with Lionel Richie or Temptations with David Ruffin. Oh, uh, that, that's uh, Ooh. Uh, same. I'm, I'm gonna same comparison. Love. Uh, the Temptations, but just a diehard fan of David Ruffin. And uh, David Ruffin's voice, Lionel Richie's voice, same thing. Those are the unique ones that you know it no matter where you are. Ah, The Temptations, so good. Coach, thanks a lot. We appreciate the time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to know when we post new content.